Hey, this is Norm from Tested.com. I'm here at the DARPA Robotics Challenge, where teams from across the world have brought their robots and their software to compete, try to build a, a robot that's good for not killing people, rescuing people. Now, I'm here with Katie Bills. Katie, you're a robotics professor at UC Santa Barbara, working with JPL on a robot that doesn't look like a humanoid robot. Tell me about RoboSimian. Well, a lot of teams have taken a humanoid form because we think we would be good at these tasks. But if you think about it from the perspective of what you'd want in a rescue scenario, it's things like stability. So RoboSimian is designed with four limbs and strength. So this is a robot that's really designed to be able to do pull-ups, for example, to be able to clamber around on a jungle gym as opposed to being a little bit more delicate and uh, human-like in form. Let's talk about the stability angle first. Now, with a bipedal robot, you know, we take walking for granted, standing for granted, but when you're on four limbs, legs, what can you do when you have legs of equal dexterity and strength? With um, legs like Robo Simians, um, you can really reach far and you can really take advantage of a lot of complex geometries. So for the bipeds in there, you notice even though the terrain has some slopes to it, those cinder blocks still give you a nice flat surface. With a robot like Robo Simian, we could really just deal with gravel, um, even sharp pointy rocks because you basically have a table. You've always got three legs of support. Um, you know, if something slips underneath you and the robot falls by a few degrees, it's not really falling. It's just readjusting itself. And so in designing the, the software and the algorithms to walk in a, a four-limbed gait and even you know, be able to stand up on two legs, what is a robot, what type of situational awareness does a robot need to have of the environment and of its own body? Uh, well, the robot needs some sort of map of the environment and some sort of way to decide what is a, a reasonable foothold or not to use. Um, a lot of quadrupeds, they only really care about like the, the end effector of its foot, like the, where the last point is going, mm -hmm. like the XYZ position. But this robot, since those legs also have to be used to hold tools, it cares about six degrees of freedom, so XYZ and the roll pitch and yaw. That's great for manipulation, but for locomotion, it means those degrees of freedom can potentially get itself tangled. So if you think about playing Twister and you don't plan about it well in advance, that's the program that can happen with mobility for Robo Simeon if you're not thinking carefully about where to where to put all those degrees of freedom, all those actuators. There's a lot of elbows going on over There's there. A lot of elbows. Basically, it's a robot that has three sets of elbows. So if you think about two ways to put each elbow, there's often eight different solutions on how I'm gonna twist my joints around and the robot's essentially unfurling its limbs when it wants to take a really long step. So what are the advantages of having that type of design where you have so many joints, so many points of rotation, actuation, is that for that dexterity, for actually using the legs as an arm, as a... Exactly. You could imagine designing a centaur that has four legs for mobility and another two limbs to do manipulation, but that means you have to use more batteries to carry that much more weight. Why not just use the same limbs to do both? So that's exactly what we're doing. And I know JPL also, for this challenge for DRC, developed a robot called Surrogate, which uses a similar arm structure. It looks like these arms are very versatile. They can be more than just arms. Absolutely. The, the, uh, the arms use the same geometry for each of those three links, basically those elbow joints we're talking about, the same actuator and, and each one of the degrees of freedom. And surrogate basically uses the same identical limbs. It's a little bit not obvious when you look at it. Two of them as arms and a third one as a torso. So it can basically use an arm as, as, its, as its body to orient around where its head is pointing and then use the, uh, the two real arms to actually manipulate things and lift things with, with two limbed uh, dexterity. Now with that type of like spider-like movement, even we're seeing like in the video for example, the robot's not moving that fast. Can you walk us through just a okay, step by step? I, I should be honest, like this is actually sped up seven times <laughs> to look reasonable there. So this is a robot, like I mentioned, that's designed to do pull-ups. There's a trade-off between speed and torque, right? So if you're riding your bicycle and you want to go up a hill, you switch to a gear where you have to pedal like mad and you're going slowly. So the robot moves at about one radian per second, like 60 degrees per second. It's like one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. But it's very powerful, strong enough to do pull-ups. So because of that, you're going to see the robot moving slowly and deliberately. But unlike some of the other robots, if something's in the way, a rock, it can probably just push that right out of the way because it has that strength. 
one of the parameters of this challenge is the robot has to get out of a vehicle and right. get to the location. That might be more suitable for a robot that's humanoid, but Robo Simeon also, surprisingly, can sit in that vehicle. Is that one of the bigger challenges for it to get out? On the one side, we thought that the driving would be the most challenging thing because trying to get the robot into the car is so crazy. Once we actually started working on it, we realized in some ways we are at a real advantage in the car. You can see how complicated it is to try to twist its leg out right there because the chassis of the car is sort of like a jungle gym. So we have stairs in the contest, but they're actually pretty easy for a humanoid to do. They don't even have to hold onto the rails. We would really excel if we had something more like a jungle gym or a ladder that required, like imagine all four of the limbs had to grab onto a ladder. That's, that's actually more similar to the car egress where Robo Simeon really performs highly reliably. And, you know, think about robotics in general, a lot of the parameters of this challenge, specifically in other designing robots, is to make robots accommodate the world that humans live in, the stairs right. and, and the cars that we have to use. When you're, as a roboticist, do you think it's better to design robots that are more versatile, you know, for other types of environments that ro humans have no place in? There's definitely a place for both. So most of the robots that um, we're going to be interested in, robots in the home, they're going to have to deal with, the important word is variability. So they have to deal with human-like environments, but maybe your dog is sitting on the floor and you don't want to step on the dog. Maybe you've got a split level you know, floor. Maybe all the kids' toys are sitting out there. You have to be able to deal with that. There's also a place for robots that can go places where it's not safe for humans. That's definitely more the direction that this is aimed at for both Terran environments and potentially in outer space. And potentially, speaking of Terran environments, I don't mean necessarily the ground, in the water. There's an aqua simian that's uh, in the design phases right now that would be able to work like the deep water horizon, that kind of scenario where you could climb around to repair things. So Simeon as a platform, what JPL is doing is not only for, you know, for Earth, for space, but also just different environments um, go going forward as well. Exactly. Any environment that's got complex geometries that needs some unique mobility to be able to have surfaces to grab onto and where you need high degrees of freedom to kind of open up your options to give you a larger menu of things you can do and as I keep mentioning to have that strength so you can really operate the world around you. So I think we designed this robot thinking about what's really useful in a rescue scenario. 18 months ago when we saw the DARPA trials I think it was like light bulb for a lot of teams like we could just design a robot that can just do the DRC. So a lot of the robots have a morphology which is fantastic for the DRC. I think if I were picking a robot for a real rescue scenario, a robot like RoboSimian or Chimp would probably be my top picks. So these robots have are paired with you know, human controllers. They're not fully autonomous. What's the difference between a robot that you have human control as a, and in some degree of autonomy and a robot that you see like building a car that's used for just fabrication? Right, exactly. I mean, robotics has been around for a long time, and there was flourishing in the 80s. Those robots are really designed for a planned, we think about the term robotic, repeating kind of set of tasks. So if I have a robot where I can bolt it into the ground, and I'm moving the joints around, and I know exactly where a car is, and exactly where I'm going to do the welding joints, the term robotic we think of as meaning doing the same thing again and again. Now, these days, we think of robotics having a lot more flexibility. The key word, I would say, is variability. These days, we really want robots that can deal with a whole variety of tasks. So um, one thing that's important is that the robot is no longer mounted to the ground. It has to be able to travel around and be able to manipulate objects in its world. Um, so you'd like to have a set of behaviors that you can do, but not scripted behaviors, not where you do exactly the same thing. It's a set of behaviors that have to be robust. And robustness really means being able to be reliable, um, when you're subjected to variability that you can't always predict. So Katie, uh, another thing that humans, we take for granted in addition to standing, something simple like opening a door, you know, uh, what's, what is, goes through the robot's software and programming to get it to open a door? What is the challenge there? Right, yeah, we take it for granted when we're opening a door. You may have like walked into a fancy building where you pull in the door and it does, you're expecting it to rotate about a hinge, it does something a little bit unexpected. A human will just go with the flow. You feel those forces and you react. The robot is gonna do exactly what you, it, you tell it to do. So if you tell it to open a drawer, and it's pulling it outward, it assumes that there are certain degrees of freedom, there's certain affordance, it's gonna slide on rollers. If you're opening a door with a handle, it normally rotates about a hinge. So if you tell the robot, you know, just something like pull on the handle, and it pulls outward like this, you could just rip the handle off if you're strong enough. In fact, in the trials 18 months ago, we had practiced with a turning door handle that was used to turning 90 degrees, and in the trials, the door handle was only gonna let you turn 70 degrees, and we broke the fingers on the robot because of that. 
Wow, so it's about a measure of feedback. Again, this is that situational awareness, not just what's around the robot, but right. what's in contact with its own limbs, its own strength. Exactly. That's something that the robot needs information on. Exactly. There's two approaches to deal with that. One is that you have a menu of, of varieties. An operator can say, OK, I need to understand that it's rotating about this degree of freedom and not sliding. The second is what you said. You're going to need to use feedback. And that's really the preferred method. You'd like to do both. You'd like the robot to have the best information it can when it does a plan. But it needs sensors to say, wait, those aren't the torques I expected to feel. Like, I need to stop and reevaluate and understand that things are moving in a different way and plan that is a really tough challenge and one that we're still trying to address in the field. Thank you so much, Katie, and good luck to your team. It's great to meet RoboSimian here. Thanks. Yeah.